Okay, all right. We might get started just on time here. We've got quite a lot of people online, um, 18 so far. So welcome to our first actual, I think this is our first hybrid DDSN meeting. We've, we've always been virtual till now as a consequence of the fact that this network started during COVID. So what we're going to be talking about today is using generative AI. And in particular, we're going to be talking about a couple of programs, um, DeepNote mainly, uh, as well as ChatGPT. And also, if we have time, we might have a bit of a look at GitHub Copilot as well. So you're going to draw a bit off yours. Okay. So um, I've just gone through that really. So um, we'll also give a bit of background to the Data and Decision Science Network as well. And we're going to hope that these slides stay up for those of you who are here in person. Okay, so first of all, we'll have an acknowledgement to country here. So we can just read the text here while we admire the beautiful flame tree artwork there by Samantha Hill. So I will introduce myself first and then I'll hand over to Colin. So I'm Marika Batterham. I'm the coordinator of the Data and Decision Science Initiative. And I'm also the director of NIASRA, which is the National Institute of Applied Statistics Research Australia and the Stats Consulting Centre here at uni. I'm really passionate about data literacy. So most of these talks are designed to improve data literacy across campus. And I'm mainly an R Studio SPSS user. I love machine learning and I like learning about new packages. And since ChatGPT4 advanced data analysis capacity came out, I've been really keen to explore those sort of options. And this is Dr. Colin Corti, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, everyone. My name is Colin. I'm a research uh, postdoc in uh, graduate medicine. So I started using ChatGPT 4.0 to do the data analysis. Kind of, kind of when it came out and played around with it uh, and found out that it was really, really fast and made beautiful gra uh, graphs. So I'd spent six months learning how to make things in R and then five minutes learning how to do it in ChatGPT. So I realized then that, you know, it would be a lot more efficient to, to learn this new system. <clears throat> but I don't consider myself to be an expert. I think the difference between knowing what I know now and knowing what I knew at the beginning is about 30 hours of work of playing around, of just trying stuff and see if it works. So I consider myself an early adopter, but a very enthusiastic one. I think this is great. I think this is probably the future for data analysis. Thanks, Cole. So just to give you a bit of background about why we have this network and why we're holding these meetings. So the network and the initiative that it's part of is actually part of the UOW strategic plan. So this initiative started in 2021 and it came out of a report that recognised that UOW had to stay up to speed with its data science capacity. So there are four aspects to the initiative. So there's a research and education component and also an industry engagement component. And this network is part of the research component where we're holding themed meetings to emphasize translation. And it's across campus. It's not just for people who are active programmers, it's for anybody who's interested in data science and the application. And we're also very heavily focused on training. So we have programs for HDR students and staff, as well as trying to make changes across campus to our undergraduate subjects. So now we'll get started and I'll hand over to Colin. So thank you, Marika. So this is such a new area. I think ChatGPT 4.0 came up less than a year ago and things have moved pretty quickly since then. So I've started using apps and then those apps have been uh, stopped, unfortunately. And then, so it's a very shift, it's shifting grounds, right? So I think take everything I say with a grain of salt. Deep note might not be here next week or we know, but I really hope it is because I pay for it. Um, so why would we use AI for data analysis? I think there's a couple of reasons. The one is that it is just so much easier, so much easier than, than using R coding. The other is it's faster. I don't actually know this is true. I think, I think what the real reason is, is that it's more reproducible and I'll talk about that. 
And uh, what I didn't put down here, but I should have, is it's less mental no mental load. So it doesn't go faster, but by the end of the day, using using deep note compared to, to coding for the day, you, you're fine. If you code for a day, you'll be exhausted. If you use deep note, you can do emails at the same time. It's writing code or, or whatever. Um, and also because AI is cool, obviously, you know, we're at university, this is probably the future. It's, it's, it's a cool thing to be part of. It's, it makes making boring graphs quite fun. So I like that. But just touching on the reproducibility, which is not something I think everyone jumps at when they, when they talk about AI writing code, but uh, this is something that, and I'm probably preaching to the converted here, we do as a university, all universities, we do a really bad job. We do a terrible job, right? So this is a paper from uh, computational biology talking about how we should be doing our data analysis. And it says things like, uh, keep track of your results and how it was produced. Now, I don't always do that. If you're working in Excel, you don't do that. If you're working in SPSS, you don't do that. If you're working in R, are you leaving comments that other people could read? I bet, bet $10 you're not, because I never do, never. Uh, avoid manual data manipulation steps, I don't do that. Always store raw data, I do do that, that's easy. Um, and provide public access. So you can see these are the things we should all be doing, and we've known about this for a long time, and we don't tend to do it, right? Uh, and why don't we do this? Because we don't have to, no one makes you, um, but this is from nature and the nature level journals are saying, yes, you have to start doing this. If you, if you use your code, you have to provide it, you have to provide it in a way that someone else can actually read it. Um, there's no reward for doing it. Like this is good science. Everyone agrees this is the right way to do things, but we don't do it because you don't, there's no benefit, right? And there's certainly an advantage of not doing it. Um, in some cases, if you ever watch Retraction Watch, you can see a, an abysmal amount of papers where they aren't reproducible and they've hidden the fact that they have dodged up the data or whatever it is that they do. And so if you ask them for the data, they won't give it to you. If they ask them for the code, they don't have it. And the reason they're doing that is because they are uh, faking the data or something, right? Or using really bad techniques. So this is not us, but this is a thing that happens. And we want to be able to say that this is not us and say, hey, we can easily do it. Um, so the other thing is it takes skill and, and time to write code, but I think most of you here would be okay with that. Um, so what I would add is it takes a lot of time to document your code, explain what it is you did, why you did it, so that someone else who isn't, can't read the code can pick it up and actually not be, you know, not be confused. Um, and you know, what if all this was really easy and, and quick? And you're probably thinking, if you've tried to ever read someone's code, if they haven't documented, it would be magic, right? It would be magic for you to say, write me a plain English document just explaining what I've just done with my coding. Uh, so AI to the rescue, maybe. So if you haven't used generative AI, I find it hard to believe, but anyway, if you haven't, uh, the way it works is you have an idea, you, you, give, you write that idea to the AI using a prompt. So um, prompts, there's a lot of work in prompts, how you prompt the AI matters. In this case, the AI would turn this into Python code uh, and then make a graph, right? So it's, it's pretty straightforward. You still have to have the idea. So they, they can write code. So ChatGPT and, and other things can write code and they can also edit and correct code. If you have bad code, you can feed it in and it will fix it for you. And they can do all the stuff you can do, right? They can clean data, calculate variables, make graphs, change those graphs, polish the graphs, everything you can do that you might want to do, they can do it. You don't have to know how to code. It does help a lot. Um, and just as an aside, I'm giving this talk today, but the guy I follow is this guy, Luke Barros. He talks about uh, Copilot. He talks about all the different AI systems. So um, he's always putting out a new video saying what is and isn't working this week in terms of what the new system is, because there's so many new systems. So I guess what I'm, what I'm saying here is that this change is going to be from typewriter to computer. I think everyone's on board with that. You still have to know what your story is, but typing has just got a lot easier. Uh, something to talk about that's always very important is the ethics of what data you feed into AI. And it's, this is something that's changing. <clears throat> um, you have to be careful. Like you always have to be careful about sensitive data. I'm not going to go on about this because I think everyone on board here is probably pretty, pretty good here, but you know, publicly available, not vulnerable, not at the identifiable. Uh, you can put an application to use chat GPT or whatever it is you're going to use to ethics. And they will say yay or nay, as they always do, because there's been problems. This is a recent one, but you know, chat GPT and all these other things are not that secure. Um, whether or not you care if someone else can read your stuff is probably a good indication of how much security you need.
anyway, something to think about, right? Don't just feed data in here. So um, I've been working on this in this area a little bit, a little while now, so maybe maybe six months. And there's been different tools. I just wanted to talk about the different tools. ChatGPT, the first tool, uh, run by OpenAI, runs Python. So if you are, that's the program it runs. Very very easy to use. Um, you can record your prompt. So you say make a graph and we'll write that down. It will record the code. You can go and get the code. You can't edit the code though, which is pretty annoying. You can't easily share it. And the thing that really got me about ChatGPT is it throttles you after a certain amount of uses per hour. So you do make the graph blue, make the graph red, and all of a sudden you'll say, all right, you've had enough now, come back in three hours time and cuts you off, uh, which I had an early different version of slides, but it, that's the worst thing for me because you know sometimes you can spend a whole day on this stuff. You don't want to suddenly have to delay everything for three hours. So um, I was looking for alternatives. OpenAI uh, open lets other people use their model. The, the large language model. So there's quite a few out there. Today I'm talking about DeepNote. So DeepNote uses the same large language model, same approach. You just write prompts to it. Uh, it writes Python, SQL, and a couple of others. It's not as easy to use, I thought, um, but it does record the same stuff. So it records the prompts, records the code. You can actually go in then and edit the code. So you make a graph, the graph's slightly too big. You can actually go and change the code, and tweak the code which is actually a lot easier than ChatGPT. ChatGPT, you'd have to say, make the graph slightly smaller and it would, and then it wouldn't quite get it right and so on. You can um, also share that code. So we could all be working on the same code book at the same time. And it's basically a Jupyter code book with, with an AI integration to write the code for you, uh, which is great. It's also pretty secure. Wouldn't stake my reputation on that, but it's more secure than ChatGPT. It's done a lot of security stuff in the States. So pretty good. I just say I'm not paid by DeepNote or anything. I just think that they're, they're cool uh, and they're probably the winning app at the moment. So just some notes on, on, on using prompts with DeepNote or ChatGPT. It's kind of like talking to a research system. That's how I approach it. So you want to be clear. You want to really show you know what it is you want. But you can give really uh, broad prompts, clean the data, uh, perform exploratory data analysis, and it will. If something goes wrong, you can just in your prompts, right? You know, what why is that number so high? Go and check it and it will make some graphs, make the graphs beautiful. That's a prompt that actually works quite well to my shock, but it will. So you make the graph, the default colors, whatever the default size, and you say, yuck, it will go back and it will. And th this is the best thing about it, right? It's learned what I like because obviously beautiful is, is subjective. <clears throat> it learns what I like, what I consider beautiful. If I make a graph, it has a gray grid, for example. So now DeepNote will apply that to all my graphs, which I didn't know it would do. Uh, it's a little bit creepy, but anyway. And you can just say make different graphs or whatever. And the thing about uh, using an approach like this is then if you feed a different data set in with the same variables, you could just run the whole thing again. You wouldn't have to start from scratch. Where there's ChatGPT, you'd have to pretty much start from scratch because it won't let you put in new data on and you reuse your code. Uh, and also because it is a large language model, it can answer questions like what stats should I be doing? Okay, so we're gonna try a live, live demo. Um, okay, so. So this is the deep notes sort of interface. There's your notebooks up here on the left. There's some data that sits down here. There's different bits and pieces that sit sort of here. You can break up your notebook into word like blocks of, of templates or whatever, but. The, the, real, the real money is in this section here. So basically you can come down here and you want to do something. So you can write the code yourself. You can put some text marked down, you can do an SQL or whatever. Uh, one thing I like to do is give it some, some basic setup instructions, right? Because uh, for some reason, DeepNote likes to make a lot of images and it stores them and I don't know why, but I just give it some basic instructions to start it off, right? So I don't like it saving my prompts as images, for example. So it will, it'll talk to you just like ChatGPT will talk to you. It will tell you the stuff. And what's interesting is I put that talk like Doc Brown because it doesn't stick around, right? All these prompts you give it at the beginning, they don't always, they don't always stick around. Um, so today we'll be using the Pima diabetes data set, uh, which is talking about pregnancy and diabetes. So to open it, you just go open. So you click on this little magic AI button down here, this little purple guy here. Open Pima 
And it's interpreted my short form as what the data is and it's done its thing and it's inspecting the data frame, et cetera. So there's the code there obviously in Python. And it will comment on anything um, and it will write code. So if you said, I will like densely written code or whatever, it'll do that as well, but you have to tell it. And then um, it will spit out basically a different version of the Excel file, the CSV file that goes in and you can visualize it if you wanted to. If you're an Excel person, you make a pivot table. You can do that if you like, um, just a manual process here, but that's quite, quite useful. But we're gonna do something else now. It's already starting to tell me about this data set, right? So it's really starting to tell me, uh, zoom in a little bit, 32 entries, different, different columns or whatever. So you can actually just say, tell me about data. And it will write the basic sort of classic information here, but it'll also give it into you in text so you can It'll tell you a little bit about there are no missing values in any of the columns, that there's how much data it uses. Uh, interestingly here, for example, it's got BMI in the CSV. It didn't know that BMI, I didn't tell it that BMI stood for body mass index. It's worked that out itself. So. Uh, and all of these as well. So part of that is because I've used this data set before, but part of it's actually just that it worked out what these, what these variables are. So you can do um, instructions like clean data and explain what you do. It. Not going to get us too far here because pretty clean data set, but it's going to look for duplicates and it's going to look for missing data and it's going to tell you what it did. Um, so, so far what we're doing, all right, you can, you can calculate data, you can tell it to, to add calculations if you want, but we're just going to say uh, explore data. Typos and all, we will just accept that, I hope. Ah, okay, so it doesn't like that because I said date instead of data. Um, form, explore free data analysis. And it will, sorry, it seems to be jumping up and down a little bit. I'll just give it a minute to finish. It will start making graphs. Now, every time it does this, it does it in a slightly different way. Sometimes it puts them all in one big array. Sometimes it looks at every graph by itself because I didn't give it very good instructions at all. But so here it's divided um, all the variables into different different graphs, right? So in the past, it's done a nice array and you could just ask it for that, but you can see here the glucose levels, it's made a lot of nice little histogram. Um, BMI, it's made a nice little histogram and you can immediately see that some of those BMIs are over 400. So that's an outlier to look out for. Uh, and glucose, first BMI, for example. So it's, it's done an interesting, some interesting work, but now you can actually say, find and list outliers. And every time I ask it to do this, it uses a slightly different method. So today it's using IQR to find the outliers. <clears throat> and away it goes. So it's told me how many outliers. In the past, what I've asked it to do is to list individual people and say the outlier, the person, what the, what the value, the outlying value is, what the average value is, what the standard deviation. And it makes a nice little table where you can actually go and say, well, this person has an outliers for everything or this, you know, this outlier, they're always outliers for BMI or whatever it is. Um, so you can actually make a table of outliers. And then if you were a good scientist, what you would do is you try to work out manually where those outliers are coming from. But today we can just say, um, what are the outliers for BMI? <clears throat> And you can just change them. So here it's saying uh, person six, BMI, 
these are all the outliers as, as used by that method. Now, if you want to go back, you could easily change the method you've used here. You could change the, the values here by just changing them to whatever you wanted to make the outliers, uh, the method applied for outliers different. If you, uh, if you know what the code says, you don't have to know what the code says though, which is great. Okay, so here it's, it's found these outliers. It's made a list, you can make that list into a table, you could export that table, you could do whatever you want, but you can also just say, um, apologies for this, but you could also say, um, change uh, 433.0 to 43.3, that sounds pretty reasonable to me. You'd have, to, I would say you'd have to check the actual data collection to, to make changes, but you can do that. And I'll cheerfully go and do that. And it already knows that I'm talking about BMI. It hasn't, it, it assumes that I'm not applying that to everything. And there we go. Uh, and now we can do, you know, uh, compare diabetes plus non-diabetes per variable with stats. And it will crunch away and do this. Okay, so that's tell you a few things. Um, might make graphs, it might not, normally it will. But again, if you tell it to make graphs, it will. But then this is the great part. You can say document everything you did in plain English. Mm -hmm. This thing, each step. And away it goes, right? So if you had to explain to people what we just did, people who didn't know what all the different things were, you can go. Um, and it will tell you, and it'll list that, and you can put it into a, a Word document or whatever you want, right? But it's going step by step, all the things we've done, which is really the documentation. So you've got the code, you've got the documentation. Um, you can share it very easily. So if you had a paper, you would say, I've used this method. This is exactly what I've done. With an explanation, there's the link, easy. The thing that I love most about this is the polishing of graphs. Um, polishing graphs to make so hopefully it makes a nice little graph. Sometimes it gets stuck in its little loop, but uh, for the most part it gets there. You can see it's whirling away up the top right here, uh, which is interesting because what I did ask it to do is not very hard. Okay, so we've made a graph, right? Uh, and there's the code for the graph. And if you run that code, you'll get that graph, but you can actually uh, you can change it. You can, um, there we go, there's a little option. So you can actually change it. So now you've written the code, you want to change that block of code, you can say, um, make, so hit that, make diabetes bar red, make other bar black. And it will add it to your existing code, but first it will let you compare the two code sets. So uh, on the left here, Everything we did before, on the right there, everything new. So previously it was blue and green, now it's red and black. Just gonna run this, see what it get. And if you wanted to go there and change it back to green, you could, and then you would just run the code and you would get your, your colors, but you could then change it. You can, um, so you can see here that it's learned, that's the size of graphs I like. I've used that in all the other versions, but it, it's not the default. It just happens to be the one I like, which is, which is interesting. But you can then say, add a label, make the text larger, make the text smaller, make an array, make the array certain size, make it a certain quality. Um, you can really add polish very, very quickly. And that's what I've used it a lot for because as you know, you can make a, you can make a graph, but to make a beautiful graph takes a little bit of extra work. If you can't do it in SPSS, you can't do it in Excel. You can probably do it in GraphPad. It's a pain to do in R but this will just do it. It'll just chew it up and, 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 and spit out this beautiful graph. Uh, you might not think that's a beautiful graph, but you could play around. You can actually say, you know, the, the journal wants 12, certain graph, certain size, certain text, 
certain background, whatever the journal requirements are, you copy and paste them, chuck them in there, and it will spit out graphs for those journals, which means the next time you want to do it, you can just put in a different journal's requirements. And there we go. So in terms of using this, it's pretty easy. It costs about $500 a year, though, to sign up to for the AI. So I did that because it's I've written several papers with this technique now of doing the data analysis. It's been great. It's been worth it. It's not cheap. And you won't get, I don't think you'll get that money out of the uni, I imagine. <laughs> um, but the thing that's, for me, the genius of this, it's going to be really good for people who are starting stats now because they won't have to learn coding. They will just be able to type into a computer what they want. So the difference there is it becomes much more about what you know. You have to know what you want. Uh, so you have to know what the names of the different graphs are, for example, or what the stats techniques are. But you don't actually have to know which buttons to click on SPSS. So it's going to be a lot easier. The other thing I'd say about this is it's a new startup. Uh, when I had a problem, I emailed them and they fixed it within like 12 hours. So it was great. You can also, as Marika mentioned, mentioned machine learning, you can plug in machine learning and ask for a decision tree. And the way you would do that is you would just type, make a decision tree, please. You don't even have to say please. And it will, it'll do that. So it has that capability, um, which I was going to demonstrate today, but it just makes a very ugly decision tree. So that's where we're up to at the moment. So I'm happy to take any questions after, after the session, but I'll hand back to, to Marika now. Oh, no, I think we have time now if you want to ask some specific questions about Deep Node or what Colin's just presented. Yeah. Thanks, Colin. That's um, What type of hallucinations? What type of hallucinations? All right, none. Great, right? So, so one of the reasons I was struggling with ChatGPT is I asked it to make a bunch of graphs and the one bar was twice as high as it should be. Why? Well, if you look back in the code, it hallucinated a number, right? That was the early days of 4.0. I hadn't subsequently hadn't seen any hallucinations, but in this I've seen none. I always still read the code though to see. If it's hallucinating, it's much easier to pick up in this because it'll just add a number. Whether it's in chat GPT, you don't actually always see the code. So if it says, oh, this category is now 10,000, you don't always pick that up, but it's been pretty good on hallucinations. I haven't picked any up. Occasionally, it will tell me, so chat GPT, you say, make the graph bars red. And say, yeah, yeah, okay, no worries. And it'll say, I've made the bars red and the bars are still black. And you say, well, you haven't done that. No, no, I have, I'll do it again. And it hasn't done it. I haven't encountered any of that in this. So there's been none of the frustration kind of overconfident. Chat GPT, if I had to put a personality on AI, chat GPT is slightly overconfident. It keeps telling you that it can do stuff and it does stuff, that it has done stuff and it hasn't. And Deep Note, even though it uses the same language model, I, to me, it feels it's like competent but slightly snarky. You ask it to do things that you can sense the eye roll, but it always does them properly. And I know that's putting personality on AI, but that's definitely the case, right? This is a more competent coding program than, than ChatGPT, I feel. Why that is, I can't explain. But it also only do this, as far as I know, it only does this. It doesn't do all the other stuff ChatGPT will do. Well, we I'm just answering questions online. Do you use it with uh, a private interface? So everything I fed into it has been public data, publicly available data, aggregate data, low risk, the lowest risk data, ethically exempt data, actually. So I wrote to the ethics committee and said, what do I have to do to use this data? And they said, it's publicly available, just go nuts. And that's probably why I've been able to use it. If you, the current... Yeah, we're gonna, we'll, yeah. we'll have a discussion about that at the oh, end, actually, because it's, yeah, it's a very important point about yeah. this. So that's yeah, definitely something we need to talk about. It's reasonably high security, though, I would say, this, this version. Yeah. You mentioned you paid for it. Yeah. A free two weeks. Yeah. Two oh. weeks. So that you can use the coding, like the, the Jupyter, the notebook itself is free, which is great. The AI is what I'm paying for. So it's $500. Oh, and free version. Yeah. You get, for the free version, you get two weeks of the AI. Uh, and then after that, you pay for the AI. Uh, so which is actually effectively paying for ChatGPT 4.0, if that makes sense. So other than just the 
attached to a UT interface, what other advantages? Like uh, the main reasons, like if I'm mm -hmm. paid, yeah. Zero. This is way more reproducible, right? So if I said to you, what have you done today with this code? You would just show me this book. You could press play. It will remake all the graphs and I could follow it block by block, follow through what you've done. So here you could start, hit the first block, get the data, hit the second block, data is transformed or cleaned or whatever you do. So you can redo it, right? In chat GPT, you can't redo it. So you've asked it to make a bar graph. It has. Um, but to get the bar graph tomorrow, you have to ask it again. And one of the interesting things about using AI is they will never do the same thing exactly the same way twice. So today you ask for a bar graph and it works. Tomorrow you ask for a bar graph, but it's a horizontal bar graph for some reason. ChatGPT has just decided that. So this is much more controlled. It's just much more controlled. You have much more ability to do the same thing. And that saves a ton of time because I spend a lot of time with ChatGPT trying to get it to do the same thing every time. And it's noticeable if your first set of graphs have a black border in your paper and your second set of graphs don't have a black border, people pick it up and then they say, oh, can you just add a quick black border? In this five minutes with ChatGPT, like an hour to, to negotiate with it, yeah. The other thing is if you're working on a group project, you can share this, you can all work together. But even like the, when you feed in the data and it, it lets you have that visualization option where you can make a pivot table equivalent, that's already better than what ChatGPT offers, I think. Okay, we've got a couple of questions online. Um, first one is about, can you do, can you pull in multiple files? Oh yeah, no worries. So you can, nice. the, the way to get a file uploaded onto this is you just make a CSV and you just click and drag. And then you can click and drag multiple files and you can just say link them all up and it, it will. So as long as you have like a link and identifier or something, or you can say, put them on top of each other. So you just have to probably explain to it exactly what you want, but yeah, it'll do that. And the second one is about, is it effective for ETL? So data wrangling. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I think um, you can certainly add new variables, add calculations, go back, go forward, transform your data. Um, that's, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah that's, it's, it's just the same as writing the code in Python, except you don't have to write the code. So as long as you can give very clear instructions, it will do it. But the nice thing about this is if you stuff up your instructions and you get 50% there the first time, you can go back, add extra instructions, and it will incorporate them which is another advantage actually, is that you don't have to get it right the first time. You can go back and you can ask for more. I think the rest is the discussion we need to have at the end about what to use, so. Um, I'm happy to take any questions at the end if anyone shoots me an email. But I think probably now you know everything I know, so. Okay, so. A, a much quicker presentation is on some other options because DeepNote and um, ChatGPT4 or ChatGPT in general both code in Python. So I'm an R user. A lot of people are R users and um, it's kind of a, at the moment a VHS versus beta debate, I think, about whether um, we're going to go R or Python in the long run. But I'm just going to have some slides here. I won't do a live demo of this because it runs quite slowly and it's not going to progress very well um, in the time that we've got. So GitHub Copilot is another option for a um, AI-assisted completion tool for coding. So it also works on ChatGPT4 and it's a co-development between GitHub and OpenAI, the company that makes ChatGPT4. So this GitHub Copilot is trained specifically on GitHub data. And a lot of you would be familiar with GitHub for those of you who aren't. It's a way that most people who are doing quantitative data analysis manage version control on their research projects. And it has both public and private repositories and so the data, training data set it's used to develop this is actually based on over 420 plus million repositories. So it's a massive data set of code that it's used to develop this functionality. So again, it's another paid service. It's $10 a month. Um, it's often very slow to get started, 
The advantage of using this over, say, using ChatGPT4 is that if you actually want to learn to code, this auto completes the code for you. So if you're trying to learn, this is very helpful. It's also good for people like me who uh, no longer code every single day. I can't always remember exactly how to do something. So it's very good as a reminder of how to do the coding. So just an example on the same data set here that Colin mentioned, the Pima Indian data set, because Colin's already gone through this data set and done a lot of the exploratory data analysis, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to launch straight into using Copilot to help me with the question. And that's just, is there a significant difference in body mass index between those with and without diabetes? So when you open up R Studio to use R, it looks like this. And it's a bit intimidating because you've just got this blank script file and you're thinking, ah, oh, what am I going to do? Even if you've done it a couple of weeks ago, you can't remember exactly, is it t.test, is it t.test? What's the, what's the actual code to do a t.test? So what you can do is just type in, start typing. So here I've got screenshots of what I've done in GitHub, GitHub Copilot. Um, you start your uh, questions with the hash and I've just written perform the t.test. And here you can see where the code changes to gray. It's coming up with ghost code. So that's a suggestion of what you might want to do. And it started with suggesting that I might want to compare the mean age. Well, that's not what I want to do. So I keep typing a bit further and go on to say that I want to perform a t-test to compare BMI between those. And again, it's preemptively suggesting what I might want to do. So that is what I want to do. So I just click the tab and it gives me the code here to perform the analysis. So I accept that and press enter and I get an error message. Now that's because R is case sensitive and I haven't picked up that BMI in the data set is in capitals and diabetes starts with the capital D. So I need to know that it's not telling me that. So you do need to have a bit of background knowledge and that's what Colin's saying. These tools are great and they're the way of the future, but you still need to know about the tests or you at least need to know to ask the AI about the tests and what the assumptions are and how it's done. So when I alter that code to have the capital BMI and the capital D, it then runs it and does the t-test. Now, if you know about R, you would know that R automatically does the t-test the for unequal variances, not the test for equal variances. And so we need to know that we should have checked the assumptions of that test, which I haven't done here. If we did want to check the assumptions, we could ask it, which I've done down the bottom here, to perform a test to determine if the variances are equal and it will give me the code to do that. So I can't remember that that code is var.test. It's giving me that code and then it will do the test for me. And then I can go and um, work out, I can put in the, the prompt to get it to perform the t-test assuming equal variances, which is the right one to use for this data. And it will go back and do the two sample t-test. So, it's good if you just need prompting to know what you're doing. So it's excellent for me. I really love it. Um, I'm just on the free version at the moment. I'm not sure if I'll keep it because as Colin said, there are a lot of ones out there. So I think DeepNote and GitHub Copilot are currently the best two that are around. So you need to sort of shop around, use your free trial and make a decision about which one's going to be best for you. Uh, in terms of plotting, I've just given it a request to plot a side-by-side -side box plot of BMI by diabetes status, and there it gives me the code. Now, again, I had to know what sort of plot I wanted, and it gives me this one here that's a bit grey on the left, and using Colin's prompting there, I've just said make the box plot beautiful, and it just gives me the code for that. I haven't had to work out what to do. It's given me that R code and made the plot here on the right, which is much nicer. So again, you could play around with this prompting and get it to do it to specific dimensions. And you could change the colors as well, um, similar to the way Deep Note worked. So this is the actual screenshot of what's happening in R. So this is all the code that I've used in that script. And so then I can save that script file at the end and I can just use that. And when I publish my paper, 
I can submit that um, file to the journal as um, my evidence of what I've actually done and to promote reproducible research. So if you were proficient at R and using it every day, you would remember how to do all of those codes and just be able to do it. But if you um, are not and you need some prompting, then it's very useful to get all of that code out using the Copilot. Okay, so what about just doing that in ChatGPT for advanced data analysis option? So to do that, all you have to do is actually upload the data set and give it two commands. So I've actually, um, I'm not going to run that live. I've just got a little video of actually doing that in ChatGPT. So you just click on the click, the click button and you attach the file that you want. So we're just going to attach our diabetes data set and it uploads. And then I'm just going to ask ChatGPT4 to perform the t-test. It would run even slower than this if I tried to do it live, which is why I've recorded it. And see here again, I'm using the lowercase bmi and the uh, lower case for the D in diabetes because I want to see if ChatGPT worries about that. Gives a little bit of a description and it just goes ahead and does the analysis. And if there is picked up that BMI is in capitals, so it's not worrying about the case sensitivity. And it goes ahead and does the correct the correct T test. So it's doing the one for equal variances. So then the next thing I wanted to do is to present the results as a box plot. So you can see that's taken probably less than a minute to do. You have the code and have to keep in those little boxes with the arrow in them? Oh, yes. I haven't printed out the code. And ChatGPT codes in Python. So it will, it will um, produce the code and you can copy the code to save it later on, but I'll show you what I've done instead because I'm an I user and it's in Python. So again, there it's presented the box plot. Okay, so because I don't want the code in Python, so you could click on the buttons and get the code, I have asked it to output the code used to perform the t-test and generate the plot in an R script. So ChatGPT generates the whole script here in R of what's being done in that analysis, and I can then save that to run it again later in R, and again, I can submit that to the journal as my evidence of reproducible research. When it converts it to R, you can see that the plot is a little bit different because it's converted the Python code to R and it doesn't always do it exactly the way you want to. So again, you might have to go and manipulate that a little bit, but you could use ChatGPT to manipulate that code as well. And as I mentioned in the chat there, if you just want to get coding advice in ChatGPT, you can use the free version. If you want to actually upload your data and have ChatGPT analyze it, that's when you have to get the paid version. Okay, so just to summarize what we've been going through and then we can get into a bit of discussion, uh, there are many limitations. So. Generative AI makes assumptions about your data and it relies on the information you give it. So the Pima Diabetes data set that Colin and I are using is used in multiple teaching um, situations. So ChatGPT actually has a lot of information about that data set if you decide to use it. But if you are using your own data, you need to make sure that you're giving ChatGPT enough information about it to make sure that it does the analysis correctly. Make sure that you, it's all about the prompting. It's all about what you ask it to do. 
And um, fortunately, Colin did do all the exploratory data analysis, but you shouldn't just be launching into any test, any statistical test or analysis without exploring the data first. So just highlighting again, and this is where we'll go into a bit of discussion. If you're using your own data, you need to beware to not upload sensitive or identifiable data to third-party applications. Now, I did have a, a discussion um, with members of the ethics committee before doing this presentation to seek their general advice. And they said that going forward, one of the things that we can do is consider obtaining consent for data to be analysed using generative AI because then you've covered yourself completely. If you don't have that, you can um, submit a, uh, your ethics submission to the ethics committee and they will consider the use of generative AI on an individual basis. And obviously that's about the level of sensitivity in the data. If the data is de-identified and um, it, there's no really unique data in there, they will consider the use of generative AI. So getting back to what a lot of people have been asking, the ideal situation would be if the University of Wollongong would consider some kind of enterprise solution where we can use this technology in a secure environment. Now, the problem with that obviously is cost or development, but ideally that's where we would like to head because this is, you can see from what we've presented, going to save everybody a lot of time, but the main issue or the main barrier at the moment for most of us is that we have data that we're not confident uploading to have analysed in this way. Um, so are there any questions about that? It'd be good to have a bit of discussion now um, before we talk about what we'll be doing in the future with the DDSI. So um, are there any other questions from anybody online or anybody in the audience? Yeah. Oh, this is specific about code. So Microsoft Copilot is an AI assistant. It's not specifically designed to do coding. So it's the GitHub has been trained on all the code. Yes, it's specifically for coding. It wouldn't be much use for anything else. Yeah. yeah. The, the Excel profile was advertised as running Python in Excel, which I think if it did that would be amazing. Um, but it doesn't actually do that. So I think, I think that's the problem with a lot of those profiles that uh, they say they'll do stuff like this, but they don't actually haven't delivered yet. I think we had like an enterprise, the Microsoft profiler. This this Python, like so much of the power of R is something that we need to start. I mean, all these tools, well, they suggest like you get a suggestion this to use, or is that like you? Yeah, yeah. I haven't tried that. Have you tried that? Yeah, yeah so I used made a decision group and it was really ugly. Hard to follow. Like I just said to, to use a different package. And but that was in Python. Was like, that, was, that was in deep note. I just said, okay, different package, please. Yeah. But I'm sure you tied that on my best because of the package. It's like the equivalent of GG plot. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have yeah. to know what you're asking for. Like, you specifically ask for a package if you know what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you have to know the package. So when you're like a naive Python person, you're going to be like, buy a little package. No, no, you just say, what are the packages? Okay, for this you. You know, what are the advantages of this one? We'll make a list. Yeah, yeah I, I know for R, uh, they definitely do suggest packages. Um, it will actually it does suggest packages. Sometimes it's packages. So that one's last year. You know, it will suggest a package that works for one month. Yes, but yeah, and also when you can use the file. Okay. No, that's but going to the dark side. It's not as good package that I've been in Python for GG close to top nine. It's just not as good. Yeah, that's why R is much better for plotting if you that, yeah. yeah, much, much better. So R is better for advanced statistics and plotting. 
Python is much better for machine learning and production line code at the moment, but they're both, I think they're both going to meet in the middle one day. Is there any discussion? Um, there is, but I don't. It's about money. I think budget. I put the pressure on, but it'd be making the right decision about which one at this time. I think is yeah. it's difficult. Okay. All right. It will. If there are no other questions, um. Going forward, our next um, session will be on the 2nd of May, and that will be with uh, Dr. Desiree Cox, who's just started here in January. She's joined us from Cambridge, and she is a self-taught computer programming enthusiast, and she works in Python. And that's going to be a presentation about how she has learned to use Python in her work and about reproducible research. and. As well as that, in that session, we're going to be launching Hacky Hours. Now, we're going to have fortnightly Hacky Hours after that presentation, and they will be both for Python. So Desiree is going to help people with Python, and Brad is going to help people with R. So we'll be having fortnightly drop-in sessions. But I really encourage you, and we'll be advertising this session in Universe, um, and that'll be a co-presentation with Molecular Horizons. I'd really encourage you to come to that presentation and hear, if nothing else, Desiree's had a brilliant career um, so far. She's a very successful early career researcher. And it's just really interesting to hear her experience as a non-statistician or programmer, again, like Colin's experience coming in and learning how to do that. Um, and also we'll be uploading this presentation and the slides onto the website. And just also, again, we'll be launching this in more detail again at the Hacky Hour, but we do have a data science and statistics community of practice. So if you have questions about what we've been discussing today, this would be a really useful place to, uh, to um, get onto. And I think Brad's going to put in the chat the link, thanks. Um, and also I think Colin's on that community of practice as well, if you want to discuss deep note. So if you've got some questions about what you're doing, that will be a really good place to discuss it. And also once we start the hacky hours as well, um, Desiree is going to come on board with that and help um, field Python questions there as well. So that's a really useful place. And also if you want some specific statistical consulting advice, uh, we have the Statistical Consulting Centre there. Um, which is myself and Brad, and there's a link there if you want to make an appointment. Okay, so I think that's everything. If there are any other questions, please let me know. Um, otherwise, we'll wrap up a bit early. Okay. Bye, right, everyone. Thanks for coming in person. It's good to see some faces. Yeah. I'm a great student, or a medical student, who never thought it was oh, I'll tell you the story. Never no, used no. R. And they wanted to write a paper, and I said, fine, but you've got to, you got to use R, to do an Excel. And six weeks, they produced, yeah. well, reproduced.